Welcome everybody to week three, day four. And uh, which is what I might have said yesterday, but either way, today is Thursday. Week three. So uh, we're going to talk about your projects because uh, we're starting to get to the point where um, you actually know enough to, to mod and do projects and stuff like that. Um, so let's get that out of the way. The, um, the projects, you have two of them. Uh, those are the only things you really have to produce for this class other than the little daily tasks. Uh, you can do them individually or in groups. Uh, it's fine. Uh, I'm going to teach you guys about the Quake 1 engine because it's something I know like the back of my hand. Uh, I modded it for over 10 years, so um, pretty much uh, you can ask me any question. There, there are some things I don't know, um, but I have friends that mod also and I, I can ask them. So uh, we're going to go over the, the uh, inner workings of modding Quake. So sort of that's kind of a default option for you guys. Um, when I created the class, I gave you a link to a download that has all of the, the stuff you need to play Quake and to mod Quake. Uh, maybe we'll play it tomorrow or something like that. I don't know. So get that downloaded if you haven't already. Um, let me check to see if it's pinned up here. Uh, it is not, but I think it's on the, um, I think it's on the announcements for IS50A under the getting started announcement. The only one there is, uh, this right here. Yeah. So that hyperlink right there is, um, what you need to do if you want to mod quick and I'll paste this here. No video. You don't have a video. Mm -hmm. Screen, screen two, there we go. Okay, um, so that that link right there is the download link, pin message. Uh, everybody should get that downloaded because uh, maybe we'll play Quake together, it's free. Um, but you don't have to, you don't have to mod Quake. Um, there's a almost unbounded number of games that are moddable out there. And um, what I suggest is, if you don't know what to do, do Quake, because I'm gonna go over it and explain how things work, and you'll actually get to see what it's like to actually work on a quote-unquote real video game, um, instead of like these uh, Unreal Engine 4 kind of demo projects we're doing. Uh, but if there's a game you like, Minecraft, Scar Starcraft, Fallout New Vegas, then, um, then mod that. And most of these games have pretty, uh, pretty comprehensive um, tutorials, things like that. So what I'm going to want from you all is a proposal by Monday. So on Monday, you're going to submit to me your mod proposal and your project proposal, your UE4 project proposal, and we'll talk about that in a second. So that'll be your daily assignment for today. I guess the daily assignments are now due in two days, just to give you guys a little bit more time because the uploads are taking forever on my end and so they're not really getting up till you know late because I, I teach until four and then I start an upload and it takes three hours or some unholy amount of hours like that and then I have to type up um, everything else then when it finishes I put the link on canvas and so you're looking at like 9 30 at night so I'm, I'm kind of giving a 48 hour window to do the daily work now instead of 24 hours just to make it easier on you guys yeah, Zoom Zoom was ridiculous too. Zoom would upload it automatically, but even still, it took it took forever to upload and process the videos. So um, I don't know, I might I might switch to a cable modem uh, after after seeing after uh, seeing that a cabin in Big Bear up in the mountains had better internet than here. Yeah, I might I might switch out. Uh, I might switch out my monitor too. I don't know. The, I, might, I don't know. But we talked about that yesterday, but. I was actually looking at getting an OLED panel now, I'm kind of thinking about that, but burn-in kind of worries me. And, and the smallest OLED is a 48 inch, and uh, this thing here is 43 inches, and you can see that thing is a chunky beast. Like that is, that is not a small monitor. You know what I mean? And um, uh, 48 inches is five inches bigger than that one, so I don't, yeah. I'd have to get like a visa mount and get an arm or something like that to, uh, yeah, I don't know. Supposedly LG is coming out with a 42 inch OLED later in the year. So I might, I might get that in the fall. Uh, making it, oh really? Okay. Um, didn't I? Uh, let me, let me double check that for you. 50B week three, three. 
possible I pasted the wrong link. It does happen. I was uploading three videos. Yeah, I clicked on week three, day three, Convex Souls part two. And yeah, there it is. It's it's on canvas. Okay, so for your uh, whole assignment that I'll do on Friday. Uh, Got to up upload that, of course. <laughs> Uh, edit video. Let's see. Did I not add it to the playlist? Uh, it's fifty B summer twenty to one. Yeah, it's up there. It's on Canvas. It's on the playlist. I don't know why you can't see it. Yeah. Works on my machine. Classic. It, yeah, it's on the playlist. It's on. It's on the modules. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a classic excuse programmers give. Works on my machine. I don't know why it doesn't work on yours. Um, okay. So, your proposal should basically talk about what you're going to do, what your idea is, uh, what makes it interesting. Uh, we've been talking about game design concepts this whole uh, semester. Uh, month, whatever you want to call it, and so there needs to be some twist, some unique mechanic that is fun and interesting. Like, um, I'm not interested in like uh, a reshade mod or something like that. It just changes the colors. Nah, I, I want something that has gameplay, um, uh, like a twist on the gameplay when you're modding something that makes it interesting. Uh, again, remember a good game. A good game to me has interest. It's a series of interesting choices, and um, if it, you know, if you mod in a weapon that kills everything in one hit, that's not an interesting mod because people would simply take that gun. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna mod Counter Strike and add a one dollar gun that does infinite damage and has a firing rate of a hundred a second. Like that's not an interesting mod to me. Like I might do that to like test. <laughs> To see if I can mod Counter Strike or something like, along the way I might actually make a, a weapon like that just to see if I can do it. You know, like, just, okay, can I kill somebody with this new weapon I've added? Okay, cool, nice. And then I would actually make a real a real mod. So, the dev gun, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, it it needs to be interesting, and interesting means that people should agonize over. Uh, the thing or not, right? Like, uh, you know, should I get your new Counter-Strike weapon or not? I don't know. Situation. Maybe. I don't know. That's that's a good answer. Okay. If they always take it, it's bad game design. If they never take it, it's bad game design. Uh, last semester, the semester before, um, uh, students added, like, a vampire gun to Quake, so it drains life from you. And so we actually went through, like, two or three revisions of that to... Um, or at least I suggested revisions, I don't know, uh, to balance it. Um, uh, people have done, um, yeah, all sorts of new weapons, mobility things, stuff like that. Can you even mod Risk of Rain 2? I don't know. Uh, I was going to change the hit scan enemies to projectile enemies in Risk of Rain 2. Does that work? Sure. Yeah. Because that, that, that would change the tactics of the game immensely. And the hit scan enemies are super annoying too, aren't they, Shammy? Risk of Rain 2. Because, like, you can't you can't really dodge them, right? And Risk of Rain 2 is kind of an absurd game as it is. And so popping up enemies, you just can't dodge and you die. It's just a big feel-bad moment. So, um, Logan complains about them every time, yeah. It's one of the reasons why I didn't enjoy playing it, honestly. So, yeah, if you could, if you could do that, if it's moddable. Um, let's see. Um, the Rain 2 mod... See if it is moddable. All right, looks looks like it is. Modding API for a screen too. Bepin packs. That's a Unity game then. Um, Bepin X is uh, used for modding uh, Unreal games. Um, I've used it for Valheim and Conan Exiles. So, ah, that's funny. Allows players to respawn as a monster when they die. That's actually. Kind of cool, because it sucks when you die in Risk Rain, because you're just sitting there, like, bored. You know, a lot of downtime. <laughs> okay. 
So yeah, there you go. There is a uh, there is a, uh, a modding pack for it. So there you go. Uh, I'm making it seem to transmute certain items in Song of Six. So I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Song of Sykes. Song of Six. One of the downsides to um, English is we don't actually know how to pronounce words. We can spell them, we can't pronounce them. Epic City State Simulator. Yeah, I was looking at this last night. Um, it's like a um, dwarf fortress for humans or something like that. Um, is there modding? Wiki. Wiki. It. You modify the text files? Okay, that's pretty easy. Um, those those games are actually really really fun to, to modify. Um, the original Rambo 6, Tom Clancy's Rambo 6, all the guns were held in text files. And the original Rambo 6 had no long-range rifles or sniper rifles, and so I actually released the first mod for the first Rambo 6 game uh, by simply taking one of the guns in the game and uh, increasing its range to very long range, narrowing its spread to zero, and um, upping its damage, lowering its firing rate, essentially turning it into a sniper rifle. And uh, yeah. and so that was just a text-based mod. Works pretty well. Um, pretty easy. Properties. T -t 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 local files. Browse. So Europa Universalis 4, which is one of my favoriteest games ever, all their stuff is in text files as well, or it was the last time I looked at it. Hmm. Mod. You know, test your job. Mod. Hmm. 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 They actually have actual mod support. When I modified it before. Anglo Russian War. Yeah, so this is what it looks like. So it's it uses curly braces to enclose things, and sometimes there's curly brace blocks inside of curly brace blocks. Basically, it's kind of like um, it's got a variable and then a um, a value the variable has, and the the variables can be structures or whatever you want to call them, uh, multiple things as well. So uh, the Anglo Russian War, if that pops off in the game. It will be a superiority, trade, mutual war, whatever that means. And uh, the Casus Belli is a trade war. So um, trade wars, you can't seize or cede land to each other. Uh, but you can do things like force them to transfer their trade power to you, uh, to redirect trade your way, to take money, that kind of stuff. So this pops off in 1807, I guess. And the, oh, oh, no, this is actual historical... Wars. So if you start the game in 1807, uh, December, then the Anglo-Russian War will be going on. That's what that means. Okay. So, uh, that's interesting. Um, delhi Janpur Second War, delhi Janpur First War, the delhi Mughal War, the delhi Turhat War. Uh, let's look at Delhi versus Janpur. That's in India, of course. <laughs> Comet. One of many, really. That's funny. Um, War Goal, Take Claim. CB Conquest, it's trying to see Central Doab. So it's starting in 1436 and ending in 1437. So if, uh, so in Europa Universalis, you can, it, it's a map of the world. And you can actually start um, at any date that you want and play any country in the world. And so as you advance time forward for a different start date, countries come, countries go, um, and countries are at war. And so if you start in 1436, then... Uh, uh, Delhi will be the attacker, Janpur and Bengal uh, are going to be the defenders, and then in 1437 they make peace and the war is over. So, um, Crusade of Varna, that should be right at the beginning of the game. Yeah, 1443. That's actually prior, I think, to the start of the game, maybe. So I think the game begins actually with the end of the Crusade of Varna, which was uh, Ottomans versus a uh, Crusader coalition. Serbia, Poland, Lithuania, Hungary, Bosnia, Wallachia, Moldova, Venice, Papacy, etc., etc. So, Defender, uh, Ottomans. And this year, uh, Karazan, I believe, gets removed as an attacker. Um, 
there's a battle at this day with this many people and they lose 60% of the people. Uh, Sultan Murad II has this many people, loses 25% of the people. And um, yeah, so it's, the, the game is it's pretty ridiculous because these are all different wars built into the, <laughs> built into the game. Just in case you don't start on the starting date of the game, right? Which everybody starts on the normal starting dates. So they can play the full game and get achievements. Uh, but just in case you wanted to start on a later date, and uh, well, there you go. So in 1562, the Mughals attack uh, Gujarat, which is in I think northwestern um, Italy, <laughs> Italy, India. Um, it that's something I really really like about the game, uh, Gujarat. And uh, it's so unnecessary too. It's just really, it's just really neat. They put that, they put that in there. So, um, modding European Universal's four is just by modifying text files like that. So yeah, northwestern uh, India, it's Gujarat province. Um, and so, if you wanted to um, change uh, anything in, the, in these text files, then they'll be changed in the game. Uh, the only downside is if you ever uh, verify your files on Steam, then it re-downloads the original ones. So it's better to probably put it up into a actual mod. But um, I've done this before. Like I took Ming. Ming. Uh, uh, that's not searches for Ming. I modified Ming because um, my wife my wife was playing it and so I changed the flag. Uh, the normal Ming flag is like this dragon kind of thing which actually looks kind of cool uh, and I changed it to a Loco Roco. So. I, I don't know if you guys have seen Loco Roco before but it's like super cheerful thing like this. So the, uh, the flag of Ming was this little dopey looking happy you know guy here. Uh, the normal mean flag is uh, very uh, serious, this kind of stuff here. Okay. Um, you got full credit on most of your exam questions on 5B. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, so that's, um, there, there's no one approach that you, ha that you have to use to modify things. For, for some games, they're just text files. You just modify the text file. And... Um, you search for it, mean. There we go. Image. Why did I not see that? Okay. All right. So uh, yeah, if I wanted to modify mean, um, it's got if statements in here. So if they have either Dharma or Emperor, then this happens. If not, it doesn't happen. Um, different start dates has different historical emperors built into it. Look at that. It's got all the emperors of China built into it, and it's got stats on each one of them. They've statted out. Let's see, where is, uh, where is, no, 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 where's Qinlong? Uh, if they don't give him good stats, I'll be angry. I'll write him an angry letter. Actually, that's, that's, uh, not Ming anymore, is it? It's Qing. Sorry, wrong dynasty, my bad. Okay. Because the Qing, the Qing dynasty is actually not a continuing, continuation of Ming. Uh, the Manchus, which are northeastern uh, China, conquered China and put their own uh, emperors on the throne. So, doo -doo -doo, uh, these are much earlier. There we go. Yeah, good. Yeah, Qinlong's got some good stats. He's a 13-point ruler. 18's the max, but uh, yeah, he's pretty good. And then... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's a reason why they went into the decline. <laughs> yeah. Um, Qinlong, uh, Yongzheng. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, five five four. Yeah, sure. Um, six five five. Kangxi. Yeah, Kangxi was an amazing emperor of, of China. Yeah, for sure. That dude is very close to maxed out stats. Yeah, you you almost never see leaders in the game with those stats. That's yeah. That's good. Well done. Well done, European Universalis. You know your history. Okay. Um, what about United States? Okay, sorry. I don't want to keep going on this, but I do I, I do actually want to see... 
because the United States is in the game too. Let's see, USA, USA, USA. So Baron von Steuben. <laughs> that's funny. That's a general. That's not a leader of the country. So he's a he's a general that you would start with uh, from fifteen seventeen fifty onwards. Um, that's and he dies in seventeen ninety four. That is really funny. Uh, he was the guy that uh, brought over Prussian drill techniques. Um, for General Washington at Valley Forge. I've actually got his training manual around here somewhere. Um, George Washington, 226. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, not, not, General Washington was not the world's greatest general, but he was able to escape successfully over and over again. So, yeah, Maneuver 6, I would definitely give that to him. Horatio Gates, yeah, he's all right. Nathaniel Green is getting... He was better than that. Nathaniel Green was amazing. Benedict Arnold, yeah, to be fair, Benedict Arnold was one of the better generals we had before he became a traitor. Sukiya, Clark, Lafayette, yeah, that's fair. None of these guys have siege. Yeah, I don't know if that's fair. Pulaski was a pretty good general, and they're kind of, kind of shafting him on this one, too. What? Do they not have... They don't have Sumter. I feel I feel insulted. I feel insulted. That'll be my mod. So the uh, uh, the fighting Gamecocks were named after um, were named after this guy. Fighting Gamecocks. Thomas Sumter. Legitimate. Badass dude, lived to be ninety-eight years old. He was the he was the oldest of the uh, Revolutionary War generals when he died, uh, and he died after riding from Centerville into town twenty miles away, playing racquetball all day at the age of ninety-eight, playing racquetball all day, driving back to his uh, driving riding his horse back to his house, his estate, sitting on the front porch with an iced tea, and then died in his rocking chair. Like, um, dude was. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, he he was a really good general. Um, if you ever saw the Patriot, um, about half of the Patriot was him, the character in the Patriot. Yeah. Anyway, Monarch and <laughs> Monarch. <laughs> That's funny. George Washington's a five five six. Ah, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Thomas Jefferson five four three. Madison five five three. Monroe six five three. Yeah, yeah, I can go with that. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if uh, I'd quite go that far on on Washington. Was he better than Chin Long? And yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. But they're they're uh, representing USA. So, um, okay. So if if there's something we're stuck on, you can ask me. But it's better we go to the communities we're modding. Yeah, I will. I will teach you how to mod Quake. Is what I will teach you. I am not an expert on modding every game in existence. So I can help you with some things like Googling things, but you know, like with Shammy, like, um, there you go. But, um, Sun Tzu, uh, Sun Tzu's way prior to, uh, the start date. Um, uh, Europe Universal starts in, after the end of the Crusade of Barna and Sun Tzu's like BC, right? Like 1700 years earlier or something like that. Um, yeah. Um, my modding community isn't very popular. It's hard to know what to do. Which, uh, yeah, the Song of Six, uh, you're going to need to get on their Discord. So, get on their Discord and say, hey, I need to make a mod. Any pointers on getting started? And here is here is my advice on that. The, the first step is always the hardest one. Okay. The first step when modding is always the hardest. And um, the advice that I have to you on that is this. Start with one small change. That's it. Start with that. Okay. So if you're going to learn to start modding Quake with me, uh, increase the damage of the rocket launcher from 100 to 500 and then shoot yourself you know 
it's a pretty easy way to tell if, uh, if, if it worked. So you start with one small change, you modify something small, but something noticeable, right? Small and noticeable. In other words, don't go into Song of Six and be like, I'm going to add cats. You know, when there's no cats, in the, I don't know, then maybe they have cats, I don't know. Uh, Dwarf Fortress has cats, at least. Uh, you, you know, don't just like start off, I'm going to do this whole AI and like all this stuff. No. First thing you do is be like, all right, I'm going to make barrels have a thousand health. Or, or something, you know? And you change it, you save it, you launch your, your thing with a mod enabled, and you click on a barrel and you see if it has a thousand health or not. That's what you start with. Um, a lot of students start way too big. You need to, like step one is just, does my development environment work? Can I make a change and have it appear in the world? Because sometimes you think you're changing something, right? Like I would change like the health of something, and then I go into the game and it's not there. So what the hell's happening? Are my source code files getting overridden by something else? That's happened to me before. I was editing the wrong file. I was editing a file that was automatically generated, right? And so every time you launch a game, it automatically generates the files again, overriding all the changes I'd made. And uh, I've actually had that happen to me in two different games uh, that I've modded, right? And you're just like, okay, so that wasn't the right place, you know? And so you need to get your hooks in. You need, you need to, you need, to start modding by just making sure you can actually change the game. Make a small change, run it, verify that it appears in the world. That's the most important thing. Then you need to get familiar. Okay. And that's, uh, you know, there's, there's a couple different parts to this. The first part is um, what's in the source. code like what's in there right like we just looked at um history files for all these different wars all these different generals for every country They're, they have different generals and, and different leaders for the country so that's what's available for me to mess with like just by editing a text file right so i wouldn't try doing something other than that you know and, and there's other directories as well and so you need to go through each of those different directories and see what data is available. And that is the kind of stuff you can modify, right? Uh, I'm not gonna patch European Universalis 4 to have VR support, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if that's not in the game right now, I am not modding in VR support for European Universalis. Like you might have this great idea, you can mod it, you can like look or, like you're on, you'd spin the earth in front of you and reach out with your hand and zoom it. Like, no. <laughs> Unless, like, you know how to do that already, I would not do that. I would see what's in the source code and then change something that is possible to change. And so getting familiar uh, involves a couple things. What's in the source code? And that will let you know uh, what is possible and what is impossible. Okay. And by impossible, just meaning, like, outside the scope of a first semester game development class. So once you do that, then I'll write your proposal. <laughs> okay, don't write your proposal until you know it's possible. Okay, so step three, then write your proposal. It'll be due on Monday, okay? Due Monday. And uh, if you have any questions about it, I, I'm in general, I approve all of the mods. Usually I, or, or all the project proposals, I usually approve. However, um, I will, uh, suggest modifications to scope. Um, scope is um, the biggest uh, scope. Not just mouthwash. Uh, it's how much you're going to do. And that can be the hardest thing for new programmers to uh, estimate. A lot of people overestimate uh, what they can do. Like, uh, I'll just add in some... Uh, like right now, Europe Universalis has foot soldiers, cavalry, and uh, cannons. I'm going to add in airplanes. There's already three unit types. Should be possible to do a fourth one, right? Wrong. <laughs> or maybe it is. I don't know. I actually don't know Europe Universalis that easily. But based on what I understand, that is not at all an easy change. Uh, at all. You know, especially if you're going to be doing things like allowing the planes to fly over mountains and things like that. 
the entire game engine is based on having like impassable mountains you have to go around and things like that um way outside the scope of this class way too big like but i'm just adding airplanes way too big right and then some students are like i'll just change the color of a block in minecraft and uh and that's too small right um so uh uh <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually pulling your leg uh, if, you, if you're going to do something interesting with it and actually add a new block type in minecraft by all means go for it but if all you're doing is just changing the color from like green to yellow that's not good enough right you got you got to do something again with you know uh, interesting gameplay okay. it's going to have an interesting twist on gameplay. Okay. So if you add in recipes that involve sulfur blocks um, and you take damage when you're standing on it and things like that, then yeah, it starts getting interesting to me. But if all you're doing is just like changing, and I've, I've had students propose those as well, especially those that are uh, taking multiple summer school classes, which uh, seems to me like a bad idea because you know, you're compressing a, um, you're compressing a, entire semester into four weeks as it is right so um uh yeah see Olivia. but some will try to just like like i had i had a student change um want to just change one of the models in quake so open up blender and uh just switch out one of the the models i, I don't even remember what it's for like the center gun just switch out the center gun model for a different one that, that she was going to make. Nah, not, not big enough. You know, you got, you got to think bigger than that. So, uh, some students go too big. Some students go too small. That's usually what my, my feedback's on. And then if there's no interesting twists on gameplay, I give feedback on that as well. So, uh, if you have any questions about what you should mod or what you're going to do, uh, message me and I will talk to you about it. There's only, you know, a dozen or so people in this class. Um, you're not, you know, like I said, my office hours are 24 seven. Uh, posting on the help center, by the way, uh, is one way of getting my attention. Uh, but I, I only check the help center every so often. If you message me, then it shows right up on my phone. Uh, the help center is really set up so that other students can help other students, you know, so you can just post like, Hey, how do I, how do I do a trace line again? And then the other people in this class are like, Oh, this is how you do it. And uh, wait, is I, I couldn't see on the video. It's kind of blurred. Is this attached here? Is this attached here? And, and like I said before, feel free to help each other out up until the point where you're just like copying things wholesale, right? Like it's it, it's really not the kind of class where I'm like, you copied Quake and modified it. Like <laughs> that's the whole point, right? Like we start with an existing game and we modify it, right? So as long as you're not training in exactly the same thing, like we copy, you know, liberally from each other in, in game development. Okay. So feel free to help each other out in the help center as well. Uh, the only course I want to take in the summer is computer science courses. Uh, we also don't have computer science courses. So, you know, there's probably that too. This is kind of a computer science class. So I am the, uh, um, well, I'm not the, sorry. We have two computer science professors now, uh, full time. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the two full-time computer science people, so um, I prefer teaching game development over the summer rather than programming, because I enjoy game development. It's fun. So, um, bu 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 um, making it crash. Uh, that's a good quote. Start with one small change. Yes. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single change to the health of a barrel. So. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, just, uh, you know, just message me. If you have any questions, uh, you know, message me. We can, we can hash out. If you're, if you're completely lost for ideas, um, what I would do is just think about any game that you've played. If, you, if you've never played video games, then, I don't know, Mod Quake, I guess, by default. But if you're, like, at a loss of, like, what to do, just think of your favorite game, um, on PC because console games are sorry they kind of suck when it comes to modding um, just think of your favorite PC game and think about something that bugs you about it right so like in uh, Fallout 4 uh, the biggest thing that bugged me about Fallout 
shouldn't say that. There's a lot of things that bug me about Fallout 4. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, one of the biggest things that bugged me about Fallout 4 was the fact that your companions would fall through the floor. And they'd all be stuck underground. And there's no way of getting them back. And so one mod that uh, I wanted to write for it and didn't because I uninstalled the game because I was done with it. Um, the linear nature of it just drove me crazy. Um, was to write a mod for it that would be like a whistle and then it teleports the the companion to you. Just to unfix the fact that I have a whole collection of uh, uh, companions hovering in an underground bunker somewhere in, in, uh, um, in the Fallout 4 game. I like Fallout 4 as a middle schooler, but I realize how boring it is. Yeah. Uh, I was going to mod Fallout 4 to make a dash ability or more perks. Yeah, sure. Uh, there, there's plenty of there's plenty of mod packs that do that. I'm, I mean, it's been years since I've looked at it, but uh, let's take a look at it. Um, so Nexus mods. Uh, did I accidentally create another window here? Uh, no, okay. Uh, the songs of six found me. They're bad, not good. Um, yeah, Fallout Four is the third most modded game on um, Nexus mods. So some of these, some of these things like modifying perk trees and things like that, they um, require you to install additional stuff because the the game engine itself doesn't um, really support it very well. And max all specials and perks. Reasonable workbench perks, perks and leveled, leveled perks, nuclear perks, hardcore perk tree overhaul. Okay. So requirements, no. Okay. So you don't have to install anything. Nuclear perks. All right. Nuclear perks. Okay. So neat. So complete perk overhaul. Okay. So yeah, it's doable. Oh, look at this. I did open up another one. Look at that. It copied, like, copied my existing stuff. That's wild. Okay. Um, if the perk overhauls were good, I'd actually like to play the game. Yeah, but you also need, uh, you know, quest overhaul. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, not having uh, the r stupid repetitive, like, my cabbage farm is under attack. There, there's a lot of big, big problems with that game. Uh, but yeah, maybe with enough mods, it, it would be playable. I don't know. Graphics are nice, though. It's got good graphics. I do like the uh, power armor kind of thing. Um, okay. So that is that is that. Uh, so yeah. So think of think of uh, think of a game you play on the PC that is moddable, and you can check sites like Nexus Mods and just see if they're moddable. And um, and just think of something that bugs you. Because that's usually a good, uh, a good, a good starting place. Um, a good starting place is to fix what bugs you. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then after that, uh, ideas. You know, ideas for change. So, uh, wouldn't it be neat if... Something like that. Like, wouldn't it be neat if um, you could hook up the power armor and fall it forward to the power grid and turn the lights on? I don't know. Like, you know, just, you know... Uh, Europa Universalis. Like, wouldn't it be neat if, um, um, man, the trade networks, are, that's more of a part A. The trade networks kind of bug me how it's set up in Europa Universalis. It's very unrealistic how trade works in the game. Like, they're trying to simulate, like, the flow of trade around the world, and it just works out to be, like, this completely unrealistic system that just, depending on where your country is, either you just can't get very much money from trade, or you get all the money from trade in the world and you win <laughs> like my country hired 
thousands and thousands of mercenaries. Um, like I was getting my butt kicked by the United Kingdom. I'd invaded them with a couple armies of 40,000 guys. They got stack wiped uh, by the UK. So I'm like, oh, I'm rich because I have all the trade coming out of the New World. Um, I'm just going to hire all the mercenaries. And I just dropped them on Scotland and just proceeded to smash the UK into submission because the trade network just kind of stupid like that. It was good for me in that game. So anyhow, so yeah, a starting place is to fix what bugs you, like trade, but an idea for change. Wouldn't it be neat if, you know, they had a better diplomacy system in Europe Universalis? Wouldn't it be neat if in uh, Counter-Strike, if um, when you're dead, you could, I don't know, um, spectate? I'm sure they have that in there already. You know what I mean? So that's, these are, these are good starting places for mod ideas, right? Like, when you play a game enough, also, you sort of develop, like, uh, an opinion. <laughs> I don't, have you guys ever seen this before? Actually, I'll, I'll throw this out there to you guys. Have you guys ever seen gamers having an opinion about anything? <laughs> I've gone to the forum for my mod and be told I, I don't know my mod very well. It's like, fair. Like, you guys have probably actually played my mod more than me, you know? Uh, Reddit, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I know the history of my mod better than you and how it's coded better than you, but as far as actually playing it, yeah, to be fair, you, you probably actually do know it better than me. Uh, but everyone is opinionated. Like, everyone's like, oh, this sucks about the game. Uh, this needs to change. Um, and sometimes the ideas were good and sometimes the ideas were terrible. And, and sometimes I'd just implement the changes just to troll them. I'd be like, all right, dude, I made you change. And then people would start playing. Like, oh, this sucks. What the hell happened? Ah. Sorry, man. They didn't like the change. So rather than, like, arguing about balance all day long, I'd just make it. And then everybody would play it and be like, oh, what happened? <laughs> oh, sorry, dude. Got to take it out. <laughs> it's top tier. Top tier trolling by just implementing their ideas, you know. Um, but yeah, gamers have opinions. Gamers have a lot of opinions and, uh, it's, and, and, and sorting out the good opinions from the bad opinions, man, that's, that's a tough one. I, I you know, critic, talker, doer. Yeah. <laughs> In that case, the doer was the critic of the critic who was talking. Um, yeah, but I, I, I legitimately, I have implemented actually really good ideas. I would create like an ideas thread and like, Hey, I'm, I'm modding right now. Who's got ideas for me. And there'd be like a hundred different ideas posted and I'd kind of go through them. Like, oh, that's actually a good idea. And I'd, I'd write it. And, uh, sometimes it'd work out. Sometimes not. Sometimes they need tweaking, but it's one of those things where you, you have to both listen to your player base. This is like more of a, like you're a successful person now. Uh, you have to listen to your player base and really pay attention to them and communicate with them. And also you have to learn when not to listen to your player base because there's a lot of bad ideas out there. And so you need to be true to your vision for a game. Like this is a hardcore train simulator, you know, where we are simulating every atom of steam coming out of the locomotive. Like that's what this game's about. It's about physically accurate pistons and pipes and stuff like that. And if they're like, oh, just, you know, get rid of the that whole thing, you're like, no, 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 that's my vision, you know, and so sometimes you have to, like, ignore your fans, you know, and ignore gamers, and just stick to your vision when you know you're right, and then at the same time, you have to realize you can be completely wrong about things, and also that people that play your games often play your games far more than you do, and um, especially, like, competitive games, like, competitive players are, in general, orders of magnitude better than the developers at the game, right? And they know better than the developers, like, if you reduce the cost of a villager from 50 to 35, it's going to break the game. And that's actually what happened with Age of Empires 1. I was, I was watching a Sandy Peterson video, and he wanted to have something unique for the Shang civilization, Age of Empires 1, so he lowered the cost of the villager. The villager is your primary economic worker in the game, uh, other than fishing ships. That's basically the only way you get resources. And reducing the cost from 50 to 35 turns out to completely break the game. 
because people are able to exponentially produce more villagers and thus get more resources, thus more villagers. And um, he said, he, he's like, well, you know, everybody told me it was broken and I kind of agreed with him. And so I was like, eh, maybe I'll just lower it to 45. But at the same time, I don't want to make tiny little things like that because it doesn't get people excited. Like people don't get excited. Your villagers are 1% cheaper. That doesn't excite people. He's like, I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to make them 35. And then he attended the first, like, big tournament or something uh, for Age of Empires 1, and all the players played Shang. And he just went, oh, so embarrassed. <laughs> um, and one of them actually trolled him. He's like, I think I'm going to play Greece. No, just kidding. I'm playing Shang. <laughs> and he's like, uh, okay, fine. I was wrong about that, you know. Uh, and so you really, you know, especially in the competitive, the competitive world, you have to really talk to them and, um, and pay attention. I mean, I had people that were ungodly good at my game like like they were able to do tricks and things like that using the tools that i provided them that i didn't even think of that you know, and then i have to decide all right is that abusive <laughs> you know is that bad for the game or is it just cool that somebody with a really high skill level is able to fly from one balcony to the other using a combination of different tricks you know the air they fire an air gun at their feet and they get hover boots and and are able to you know get the flag and fly across the map in five seconds and capture it um, eventually I decided, yeah, that, no, that's not fun. It's not fun if they can capture the flag in five seconds, you know? Like, by the time the defense gets down to the flag room, they've already gone in and gone the flag and captured it. That's a problem. And so I had to think about how to, how to nerf it without completely angering the experienced players and things like that. But yeah. So basically, all gamers, and you guys are probably gamers too, most of you, you have opinions. Find a game that you're passionate about, the you've always wanted to see a change for, and do it. Simple as that. Uh, the motto I was talking about was for Quake. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was Capture the Flag, Team Fortress, if you've played Team Fortress before. So, like when 1% uh, of hardcore players determine the meta, it might not always be fun. Yeah. True. Also true. And a lot of times I'll see changes made to games to placate the hardcore players that just make it not fun for me, a casual player. I'm not exactly a casual player. You know, if you look at my Steam stats. Um... But like Path of Exile, for example, it's an action role-playing game in the vein of Diablo 2. Um, I've never been able to get into it because the game really is targeted at hardcore people that are spending eight hours a day playing the game. And so I've never been in the game. Right. I, you know, like, it, it's actually kind of depressing. Like, I've been the story on it. The story is even like it's not even that that big a deal. Um, but like the the end game, the end game is something called mapping, and um, I played seven hundred hours of the game. And I'm a casual player, and I've never actually beaten the bosses, the shaper, and the elder, and things like that because it just takes too much damn time, and you have to farm for items and all this kind of stuff, and it just does not appeal to me. You know, and so I play it to a certain extent, and then I'm just like, all right, in order to go any farther past this, I have to become like a person who's playing it 24 7, and that does not interest me. So, um, it's, it's a, it's a problem, right? Like, how do you, how do you make a game that appeals to casual people and to people that play it 24 7? And that's a really hard thing, right? It's a really hard choice to make. From a game design perspective. Okay. Um, I can't get into it because I can't find a fun build. You just follow the builds and they're all boring. Yeah. That's another big problem is that I like making my own builds and then they usually turn out to just be not as good. And and part of it is their fault because a lot of times the way the skills work don't actually match the descriptions. So like as it turns out, uh, <laughs> you know, if you use the earthquake skill and the there's a couple really big killer issues with this game. Um, I really like the game too, by the way. Um, but you need to provide enough information to me. And, and this is something that all of you guys should be aware of. When you're making a role-playing game, you need to provide enough information to the players that they can make the intelligent decisions. So many role-playing games I see will have a, a perk or a feed or something like that where it says, if you take this, you critical more often. How much? <laughs> Do you guys know what I'm saying? Like, 
like if you give me a, an option and especially if you can't respec or anything like that like if you can't undo the choice or if it's expensive to undo the choice i will be mad at you right yeah it increases your crit chance by 0 0.001 percent right or it could be double the chance like what is it like you need to give me information so i can agonize over that decision and 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 this is something that i that i personally really hate about the AAA games industry is that they don't want to scare people off and so they just take out all that information like you are more accurate now okay how much <laughs> you know so uh yeah earthquake uh, smashes the ground dealing damage in an area and cracking the earth the crack will erupt in a powerful aftershock after a short duration. Cracks created before the first one has erupted will not generate their own aftershocks. Requires an axe, may accept your staff or unarmed. Okay. So, uh, when you do this, it's going to do between 85 to 120% of your weapon's damage. The attack speed is a little bit slower. Costs you 10 mana to do it. Effectiveness of added damage, 85 to 120%. Cool. So... Um, the problem is, is that this actually doesn't actually, it's not actually accurate <laughs> is, is the problem. So, um, uh, so the aftershock gets 150% of your add-ons it's so like the way that things stack together is not immediately obvious in this and as it turns out like you can make ungodly amounts of damage on this due to the way that damage multipliers stack on top of each other and you wouldn't know it from just reading the description so um yeah uh there that's that's one of two major issues that they don't give you enough information to make your own builds it's just people play with it and they're like oh this is really good and they'll post an earthquake build um, and then it's boring to copy it from off, off somebody else. And the second thing is they don't tell you how you die. And like, I quit playing Path of Exile. I was on an empty screen. My character's just running around. My character has maxed out defenses. It has like a 90% dodge rate. Um, like there's like dodge and evasion. I had like 90% dodge and 90% evasion, whatever the cap is on that. And, um, D2 meta is so boring. Yeah. Well, did you hear what happened to Blizzard? We can talk about that next. Uh, Cyclone builds. Yeah. Um, there's both dodge and there's evasion, I think. And I had both of those capped. And I had a decent amount of armor on top of that. Uh, it's capped at 75% and rolled before block. Yeah, so I had, I had evasion and dodge and block, I think, maxed out. And you can actually go above 75% cap with, um, uh, yeah, I had, I had dodge spell at 75%. Um, I, I think you can, there's, there's like an item that boosts your, your max theoretical maximum. Uh, Yeah, I know. So the point is, like, my character had, like, the best defenses that I could come up with. There's probably better things you do if you play the game 24 hours a day. But I was, like, 90% dodge, 90% evade, 90% block. Somewhere in that range between 75 and 90%. And there's no monsters on the screen. And my character's just walking around on a grassy field, and he dies. No graphics. I, I vaguely remember seeing like a flickering black thing just shoot across the screen and my character dies. One hit. I'd maxed out my health. I'd maxed out all my defenses possible. My resistances, dodge, evasion, uh, block, armor wasn't maxed out, but you know, it wasn't that kind of build. And my character just died. It's like, you're dead. Doesn't tell you how you died. You just died. And at that point in the game, when you die, you, you lose a big chunk of your XP. And the amount of XP that I lost was like an hour's worth of XP, maybe two hours of XP, something like that. But I was just like, do I really want to spend an hour getting back to where I was here just to have nothing kill me again? No, I don't. And so I uninstalled the game, and that was it. So... um uh, this is Path of Exile. Path of Exile. Yeah. 
So, um, it was just like, yeah, no, like it, it doesn't even tell you, like, why did you die? It doesn't tell you. Was it, you know, what was that? You know, there's no poison on the ground or anything. I was just walking around and I just died and I lost an hour of my life or two hours of my life. And, and that was the moment for me where I was just like, no, the interface for this game is too frustrating. And I quit because of that reason. Not because I died per se. Like, I, my character would die occasionally. I'd throw myself into stupid combats and die. And that's understandable. It's not a big deal. Um, but yeah. That, like, when your game... Yeah. So, that would be something I would change. Like, if I was going to modify Passive Exile, I would add a death message. Right? Or a death replay. I think Diablo 3 had that. Where, like, um, you know, it'll zoom out and it'll show like this big boss maybe that was over there. I don't think there was any bosses on that level. But, you know, at least I wouldn't be mad. Like there's a boss over there and he did this big Kamehameha blast and it went so fast it didn't even draw on the screen. Okay, fine. I didn't know there was a boss, you know, but, but at least I would know why I died, you know? And, um, you know, but as it is, like just dying mysteriously for no reason, like you can't do anything about that. Don't do it next time. How? I don't know. So, so you guys understand. So the, the upshot of all this is that <clears throat> um, ideas for like things that annoy you or, or things you'd like to see in the game, those are good places for mods. All right. Um, so, um, yeah, you need boring yellows. Yeah, and, and then the, the, the economy, that's the third thing that annoys me at Path of Exile is that they don't allow you to set up a shop because trading is an integral part of the game. Like, you need to trade with other people to get all the things you need to put your build together. And to trade with somebody, you have to go onto a third-party website and search through all the people that have public trade tabs open. And when you find them, you have to send them a message in the game, and then they have to invite you into a party. And so if they're in a dungeon or something... Like, they're not available, and so you have to wait for them to finish. They're like, hey, hang on, I'm in a dungeon for another hour. And you're like, oh, whatever. And they finally go out, and they send you an invite, and you, you have to go into their their little layer there, and then you do the trade, and then it's just like, why why is this system so stupid? Why is this system so stupid? It's stupid. It's just the dumbest system ever. And they have public vendor tabs, so it's not like, you know, you... Like, if they just wanted to, you just make it so you just buy things off other people. They put up a price, you buy it, and um, that even stop a lot of abuse because sometimes people will put up artificially low items to drop the price of items they want to buy. But if you were able to just buy it off them, then they wouldn't do that, so it would actually fix some of the more abusive elements of the game. Anyhow, I'm ranting, but the point is gamers have opinions. Okay. Uh, obviously, buy the gear with real money. Yeah. No, I've never, I've never done real money transactions in Diablo 3 or in PoE. Uh, talk about how there's no gold. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, It's 1 o'clock, right? Fine. Okay. Yeah, so one of the... Okay, it's so one of the nice things about Path of Exile. Nice? Yeah, it's nice. Um, is that the... Um, there's no gold pieces in the game. The... Um, instead, the uh, monsters will drop uh, various items. And uh, not you... Uh, not you, not you, not you. These aren't really sorted properly. Um, things like this, okay? And so that's the currency in the game. They drop items. And these items are used for crafting. And so if you craft something in the game, that's consuming your currency. Those are your effectively your gold, your gold pieces go down. And so, for example, the Orb of Augmentation takes the magic item and adds a new random modifier to it. Cool. Uh, the Orb of Chance upgrades a normal item to a random rarity. So it normally takes a white item and makes it blue. Occasionally it takes a white item and makes it yellow, a rare item. And very, very rarely it takes a white item and makes it unique. Um, orb of Fusing adjusts the number of sockets, or the links on, on it. Uh, scouring resets an item back to white. Um, and so what people do, like if they're trying to craft the ultimate item, what they will do is they will roll... Um, reforge a magic item with new random modifiers. So they'll start with a white item. A white item is your basic item. They will use um, uh, blacksmiths. Like, if, let's say you're trying to make the ultimate weapon in the game. 
So you, you'll use blacksmith whetstones to take it up to maximum quality. Then you will turn it into a magic item uh, or, you know, unique item. You might use a chaos orb or, no, no sorry, a, um, um, where is it? I was just kind of second ago. Yeah, you can take it from normal to rare. Usually, though, you go from um, uh, uh, white to blue. And then you sit there and you, if it only has one modifier on it, you add a second one. And you sit there and you just re-roll them over and over again until you get the two perfect item modifiers you want. Then you upgrade it to a rare item using... Um, uh, uh, not you, uh, blessed orb. No, not you. Where is it? Um, it's a divine, divine orb. This one. No. Uh, wh which is the one that it goes from? Nor oh, alchemist. Alchemist. Where are you? Yeah, normal to... No, that's no, that's not it either. What's one that goes from uh, blue to yellow? And why can I not remember this? Uh, Regal? Yeah. Okay, so uh, so then you use one of these items to upgrade it to rare, and then you um, uh, if it if it has if it gets the right modifier you wanted, then yay. If not, you scour it and you go back down to white and you do that again. Given how many modifiers there are in the game, you might go through this process thousands and thousands of times where you keep re-rolling modifiers, re-rolling modifiers. Okay, I got the perfect ones. All right, cool. Now I'm going to upgrade it to yellow. Crap, I got a terrible modifier. Restart. Over and over and over again. And then you get you get the perfect modifier. Now you slap an exalt on it. And an exalt is one of the rarest um, things in the game. It adds another modifier to a rare thing. Oh, I got a crappy one. Wipe. Do it all again. And so people will go through um, thousands and thousands of these currency items trying to make the, the, the best thing. And they, they've added in things to the game to modify the random chance. Um, if you do it right, you can, you can get it so that the Exalted Orb will give you pretty good odds. Like one out of three odds of getting the modifier that you're looking for. Um, that's something they've done because otherwise it's just a complete crapshoot. You know, you get 1% chance of getting the, the right modifier. So they've done things that will like constrain which modifiers you can get. And then, uh, let's say you do get it, uh, but but uh, the percentages aren't the best on it, right? Like you have the, the top modifier, but the top modifier can do plus 75 to plus 100. You have it at 75, not good enough. So then you start using uh, blessed orbs on it. And uh, the blessed orbs will reroll the random numbers on the implicit modifiers. Then there's another one to redo the doo, 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 um, the divine orbs to redo the and none of these things are common by the way like all these things are fairly like fairly rare and so you might end up spending in real life terms like like if you converted these things to U.S. dollars like thousands of dollars of real real life money or you know thousands of hours of playing the game because these things drop chaos orbs drop like. They're, they're rare, but they're not, like, that rare. Like, you, you get excited when you get one, but they're not that rare. You'll get, like, you'll get them somewhat often. Uh, but these things, like, these are pretty rare, you know? And, and then you get the perfect item. Cool. Now you can, now you can Mirror of Calandria them, which is the rarest item in the game is a mirror. And you can duplicate it. So you can actually make money selling duplicates of your items to other people. Um, and people only do that for the top tier stuff because it is, um, uh, these are, I've never seen one of these in the game. I've never gotten one. So that's how rare they are. So, um, yeah, so it's an interesting system. The, the point is, uh, I've been talking about this for five minutes, but the point is, is that there's no gold in the system, all the things, and, and you buy items using currency. So, um, like if you want to buy an item off somebody, they're like, it's 10 chaos orbs and you hand them 10 chaos orbs. And so the, the currency is actually functional in the game. So if you don't want to go through that whole crafting process, which oftentimes I don't because I get frustrated really easily when I don't get the right modifiers that I want, um, I will just search on the website and find the right items for me and hand them the currency instead. So it's a, it's a very interesting system. 
the game itself, though, has like three very lethal problems with it, and I won't play it again until they fix those, and they're probably never going to fix those. So. Okay, all right. So let's uh, let's talk about your UE four proposal. Uh, you need to make a working game, okay? And that's that's uh, uh, buying every cucumber on the Steam market for profit. That's fine. Uh, yeah, the spiffing Brit is amazing. Um, where was you? Okay. So, um, summer. So go back into Unreal Engine. And so what I want to see from uh, you guys is a working game. Like, functional. Okay? Um, like, you actually are going to release it. Not on Steam, to me. Um, but... Like what we've been working on here, uh, there. there. Okay. What we've been working on is things to make an actual game, right? So last time we added in, we added in the ability to shoot the uh, security guard. The security guard shooting at us, it can kill us. We can kill the security guard. Okay. Um, the one, uh, there's two big pieces left. One is animation, which maybe we'll do tomorrow. And today, what we're going to do is talk about the heads-up display. Right now, when the thing is shooting us, it just prints our health up in the top left corner. Not very professional, right? So I'm going to show you guys today the basic way of doing heads-up displays. And if you want to do better than the basic way, uh, there's something called UMG, which uh, looks really nice. And there's tutorials online. Uh, I don't teach it because there's honestly too many steps involved and um i feel like my videos like even for doing simple things like you know the trace lining and stuff like that it's already like there's a lot of steps and students have to like rewind and fast forward and stuff like that to you know kind of get the get the gist of it so what i what i'm going to teach if you don't mind is the i've used umg before it's nice it looks a lot better than what i'm going to teach but i'm going to teach a simple thing because um I always like starting with simple things, and then when um, you're ready for it, you can uh, you can do the more complicated things. Okay, so we got working doors. We got the ability to build buildings. We've got elevators that move around automatically, and I can pause them and resume them. We've got enemies that shoot at us, and we can shoot. They don't move yet, and they don't animate yet, uh, but that's coming. But what we're going to talk about today is heads-up displays. And, and uh, if you're not familiar with the term heads-up display, it comes from the military. So uh, back in the day, like back in the day, like World War II or whatever, you know, when you had an airplane and you're flying it, you'd have to look down to see what's my airspeed, what's my... Um, angle of attack and, and uh, what's my um, you know ground speed and things like that uh, and the problem with that is that when you're looking down there you're not actually looking out the, out the cockpit and so the military pioneered the use of what are called heads-up displays and um, or HUD for short and nowadays um, that term is used everywhere um, I think even on this new monitor let me see uh, Maybe not. Um, it can do like the crosshair on a video game is part of the heads-up display. So this is what it looked like originally. So it had it was a piece of glass that kind of sat right in front of the the pilot, and it displayed the most pertinent information for the pilot. The pilot needs what direction am I moving? This is a compass up here. If it looks familiar to like Fallout and Oblivion and Skyrim, yeah. Um, this is uh, the angle of attack, and then uh, they'll, it'll tilt when you're uh, rolling and things like that. So um, these things were pretty nice because rather than having to look down at your instruments, you could keep your eyes outside, and then the heads-up display would simply have um, the uh, information you need uh, projected over the uh, over reality. And so video games have had heads-up displays for ages. Uh, the simplest one would just be a little crosshair. Um, if we play the game over here, you can see there's a little, do you see that over the blue, the blue mushroom, the little red crosshair right there? 
that's a heads-up display. It's a very simple one, but there you go. So, uh, what can we do with a heads-up display? As it turns out, a lot of things. Um, I'm going to teach you the basics today. Um, I've seen they cost $400,000 per helmet, Modern World Helmets. Uh, can it be a demo? I mean, I'm not expecting you guys to make, like, Call of Duty or something. It just it just needs to be working. It needs to be it needs to be a functional a functional game. It doesn't have to be um, gargantuan. It doesn't have to be like multiple levels or any of that stuff. Um, but it, you know it, you need to you need to have the ability to play the game and win. You know something. So uh, forty thousand four hundred thousand dollars per helmet. The helmets we made were about a hundred thousand dollars each. Um, fighter pilot helmet. Uh, we didn't do fighter pilot helmets. Um, just a helicopter. Military gray. How much do they cost? Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, heads up displays. How do you do it? Well, um, Wait, did you say something happened with Blizzard? Yes. Yes. California investigated them for two years and discovered that the company has a frat boy environment and they are being sued. Um, yeah. it's uh, it, it doesn't really come as a surprise to me. Um, one of my uh, friends, uh, Tess Treadwell, who worked on uh, Fallout New Vegas. She talked about this when she came to our college to speak a couple years ago. And uh, she said she interviewed for a job at Blizzard and she remembered going into the uh, the lab, the computer lab where everyone's working and the lights are all like dim so it's kind of like a cave and as she's walking into interview she sees all these heads popping up uh, behind the computers like, a girl, a girl, a girl, a girl. And they're all like staring at her as she's like walking past. She's like, yeah, I didn't take that. I didn't want to, I didn't want to work there. Um, she said they got better, but, um, according to the lawsuit from, uh, the California, uh, was it equal employment agency or whatever it's called, uh, it did not get better. And, and I, I guess it might depend on which, um, which part of the company you're working for, because Blizzard's a big company. But, um, yeah, so that, that's the thing. You can, you can look, you can look more into that, um. No wonder all their games have been sucking. I, I don't know. Like, you know, I think most people believe that when Blizzard got bought out by Activision, that was sort of the beginning of the end. But at the same time, I don't know. It's hard to say. The, I mean, their culture early in the in the 90s was very much, like, hostile to having families and things like that. Like, there were several kids that were born while their dads were in crunch time working on Diablo 2, you know, things like that, so... Yeah, follow that story. That's that's interesting. And and to be fair, not all the games industry is that way. Um, the um, the culture at a company changes a lot depending on where you're working. Um, one thing I will say is that uh, alcoholism is fairly common in the games industry. Um, a lot of game companies uh, have open bars at their work, and people will drink on the job and things like that, which is a little weird, you know, considering most. Companies don't live in the 1950s anymore, um, but like Zynga, um, which is based out of San Francisco, they've got three bars in their in their building. There, they've got a basement bar, they got a rooftop bar with a terrace, and they got a sports bar on like the second floor. Or so, um, uh, yeah. So the the yeah, like you can you can read the stories for yourself. It's it's, it's actually really sad. Like. Um, one female employee was driven to suicide by the sexual harassment she was facing there. Like, people, that, yeah, I don't even talk, want to talk about it, but um, you can read about it. It's pretty, pretty bad. And um, um, just the good news is, is that it's not like that everywhere. Like, um, it, it, it just, it depends on the company. It, I, I don't want to keep saying that, but it, it really does depend. Like. There's some there's some game companies like Sandy Peterson was describing Ensemble Studios. They're they're just all family. They all got along really well. They only fired one person the whole time they were there because they you know they just all got along pretty well and they were all focused on making great games and um, yeah uh, 
the management uh, rejected a bribe. Like uh, Microsoft tried to bribe the management to lie to the employees, and they rejected it. Like, like had principles and things like that. So you know, it it, it just really depends. And so um, when you interview for a company, they're also interviewing for you. So remember that these things are two way processes, right? Like it's not just about if you're going to fit into the company, but you also need to be thinking like, am I going to like, do I like what I see here uh, when you apply and companies like EA, like maybe, I don't know, maybe you just accept the fact that it's not a great company, but you're going to get it for your resume. I don't know. It's kind of a decision you have to make, but um, yeah, I just want to say like, it, it just, it really does depend on where you work. Some do crunch time, some some don't do crunch time. Some will tell you in advance this is how much crunch time we're gonna have. You know, just don't don't do any vacations, you know, in the two months, you know, Sandy Peterson was talking about that also. Like, you know, they knew two months prior to release, it's crunch time. You're gonna work uh, 10 hours a day for two months. And people would schedule that and they would tell their wife like, sorry, Honey, I'm not going to go on a vacation, you know? And then after the thing releases, then everybody takes off and they go on vacation. And so he said that as long as you can kind of anticipate in advance and it's not like this eternal death march kind of thing, like people, people understood it and accepted it. And he said it was pretty good. So, uh, Have you had many crunch times in coding? Yeah, it's really unpleasant. It's really unpleasant because here's the thing. Um, when you're tired, you write really bad code. And your your um, ability to debug also is impaired. And so I would get to the point where I'm like exhausted and it's not working. And so I just start changing things randomly. <laughs> you know, like I've tried positive X and negative Y and positive Z. I'm just going to try negative X and positive Y and negative Z and see if that fixes it. And then it starts working. You're like, all right, cool. It works. And you just leave it in there and you forget about it. And then it breaks things when you're traveling east instead of west because, you know, and, and you have no memory of even doing that. Like, what, where did that come from? Like, you know, and that's one of the reasons why source code management is so important. So you can look at previous versions. Like, oh, yeah, so I have one version that works if you're traveling east and one version that works if you're traveling west. Uh, I'll just grab both of those and put an if statement in there or something, you know. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really bad. It's it's almost counterproductive. And and it's, it's a very frustrating feeling because you're trying to work harder and be more productive. And you're actually, honestly, oftentimes doing damage to your project. Like you're actually going backwards. You know, and the harder you try to go forward, the more backwards you go. And so it's it's a really rough feeling. And um, it's, it's actually one of the reasons why I got into like meditation and like studying the human relaxation response and things like that because the human brain degrades really quickly with lack of sleep and stress and overwork. You know, I figure your brain's good, really good for about four hours a day. If you're at a hundred percent, four hours a day, you will be done, you know? And after that, so what, I, you know, so one thing I do is I'd schedule the coding to be in that peak four hours. And then things that don't require my brain, like meetings, right? Do that after I'm burned out, you know? <laughs> so I've, I've gotten all my work done for the day. It's three o'clock. Check out at five. Meeting time, you know, and go in there. <laughs> Get a donut. Listen to people talk. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll contribute something, you know. The meetings, meetings are one of the banes of existence. They're really, they're really not. Um, they're really not helpful in most cases. And most of the time, you've got 10 people in a room and two people are talking to each other. So those two people are having a conversation. They're, they're benefiting. And the other eight people are sitting there like, don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> so the managers oftentimes feel it's very productive because they're always talking to somebody, you know. But they're, mm, yeah. So there's, there's ways around it. Uh, I see alcohol being promoted. I'll promote fat, cookie days, donut days. Yeah, donuts are very common too. Um, anyway. 
So, uh, so where are we? Huds, Huds, Huds. Yeah. So it, it, it just depends, you know, and um, it just depends. And if you're gonna if you're gonna do crunch time, then be aware of how your own brain works. What hours am I most productive? How much rest do I need? Uh, I would I would work hard. I would work like an eighty hour week, and then I'm like, yeah, I'm not coming in next week. Or something like that. I mean, it just depends on the on the circumstance. But uh, maybe I just take off a day. I like I just worked eighty hours. I'm not coming in tomorrow. I'm sorry, you know, I'm fried. I can't do any work. I'm gonna take Sunday off. I'm sorry. Um, and then I go to the pool. I just go to the pool all day. This is obviously when I'm not married and have a kid and have to do all that stuff. Yeah, I I would just work my ass off and then I just go to the pool for the weekend and just do nothing. Just have a book, no devices, no electronics. Just reading a book, sitting in the sun, sunbathing. Wait, you work seven days a week? Crunch time, dude. Crunch time. <laughs> you think you get time off? They have beds in game companies a lot of times. And so, like, yeah. you. That way you don't have to drive home. You just fall asleep in your office, wake up, keep working. 24-7. Seven, seven days a week. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of places have showers. Uh, my place had a shower. Yeah. So... Uh, it's a thing, it's a thing, you know, uh, yeah. And so you have to, you have to learn, you have to learn how yourself reacts to stress and overwork and things like that. And then you have to kind of like optimize, like it's a problem for you to optimize, you know, and figure out what can I do to unstress and what can I do to stay at max productivity given these constraints and things like that. It's, it's not pleasant though. I'll tell you that but you can, you can make it work if you want. That's horrific. <laughs> well, do you like playing Diablo 2 or not? <laughs> was Diablo 2 a good game? Yes, it was. So it paid off. Uh, that said, sometimes crunch time doesn't result in good games. Like, for example, Anthem. Uh, Anthem was an... Like, if you ever want to read about how not to do game development, um, Anthem didn't have a direction for the first five years of its existence. They just kept remaking it over and over again. And then finally, EA was like, you got to make a game. And so they kind of figured out what Anthem was. All right, we're going to have these rocket backpack things and you're going to fly around. All right, cool. That's the essence of the game. Cool. Make it. You have a year. And so after five years of rebooting and really having nothing, they had a year to make the game. And so they slapped together like a poorly written story, um, poorly written a lot of things. And then they're like, we're Bioware. We do magic. Crunch time is where it all comes together and magic comes out. So even though it's nothing right now and it's terrible, we're going to just push people into crunch time for two to three months and it will be the Bioware magic all over again. And uh, it didn't. And Anthem was a total failure. So. Um, Alright. So. What caused companies to have to go into crunch time? Bad scheduling? Um, it's just... Um, I mean, like, like I said, at, 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 at Ensemble, they scheduled crunch time. Like, you know, they're like, two months before release, all hands on deck. Everybody's going to be play testing. Everyone's going to be doing QA. Everyone's going to be, co like, coding if you can, you know. Um, but really, it's just, you. a lot of times, you got a deadline. Like, for Fallout New Vegas, uh, the people at Sony were going on vacation. <laughs> and so... Uh, in order to get the, uh, in order to get Fallout New Vegas out by uh, whatever t target launch date they'd set, um, I seem to think it's in like summer. Um, I can't be right. Um, released in October. Okay, yeah, it's more more recent. So they they wanted it to come out uh, prior to the holiday season, right? Prior to Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, because that's when, you know, there, there's big upticks in sales and things like that. But the trouble was was that Sony was going on vacation. And to get your game approved to go out on the PlayStation Xbox, it has to go through this multi-step verification process that gets the stamp of approval that allows the game to go out. And if they miss this deadline, which was, you know, like, I don't know, six months ahead of it or something, then the Sony people go on vacation and they can't submit their thing to get it approved in time for the holiday season and they lose a lot of sales. 
And uh, so they had that factor. They also had another factor, which was that um, they were they would get a million dollar bonus or something like that. I don't remember the exact number uh, if they got a Metacritic rating of eighty or better. And so they needed the game to like not have bugs, and they needed the game to um, pass the the Sony certification. Which there's a lot of things that go into it, but like you can't have big frame rate dips and you can't crash and things like that. And if you know Fallout New Vegas, it crashes. So, um, <laughs> you know, like they, they were under a lot of pressure. And so it's crunch time. You know, that's where crunch time comes from. It's like you got a deadline and it, all hands are on deck and people are cleaning up dialogue and they're fixing bugs and, you know, and they're trying to get it out the door by this particular date. And, um, they used to show Metacritic ratings on these things. Um, hmm. And so what happened was they had the game running on Xbox, PS3, uh, it was probably Xbox 360, PS3, and PC. And it was working fine on PC. And by fine, I mean it was buggy as hell, but, you know, it was good enough. Um... And it was working fine on Xbox, but on, um, maybe it was like, I think it was, maybe it was a Metacritic of 85. Whatever it was, they missed the Metacritic rating by one point, and so they didn't get these giant bonuses. And then for PS3, it wasn't working very well. And uh, for whatever reason, they couldn't figure out why, was it just, when you had a lot of NPCs on the screen, the frame rate would just tank. And so Sony was not going to approve this, because when you're walking in New Vegas, the titular city, the frame rate drops to like 10 frames a second. And they're like, we can't figure out why. Uh, the PS3 is a radically different uh, engine under the hood. It uses a cell processor and things like that. Um, they couldn't figure out why. Long story short, they didn't have time to figure out anymore. So uh, the head of uh, the head of Fallout... Uh, I don't know if it might have been my friend. Who knows? She was relaying this this fun story. Uh, their solution was just to actually delete tons of NPCs from the PlayStation 3 version. So on the PlayStation 3 version, there's just less people on the streets. And, um, and they were like, you know, put, put it out. You know, like, this is the only way you can get it to work. We're just going to delete two-thirds of the people. And, uh, and they were sort of, they didn't tell anyone about this, you know, they just sent it off to Sony and Sony approved it on time and all this other stuff. Uh, and then they were kind of nervously watching the reviews when the reviews came out and all of the, should I buy it on Xbox versus should I buy it on PS3? were all focused on the graphics. Nobody apparently noticed that they had just deleted like massive, there's like this massive genocide of NPCs and just like nobody noticed. And so, like, all the head-to-head -head comparisons were on, like, graphics quality and, like, how far away you can see the textures and things like that. And they're like, you should buy the PS3 version. It looks better. And, like, just, like, nobody noticed that they had deleted most of the people from the streets. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's just, just one of those things, I guess. But that's, that's crunch time, right? So, um, yeah, 84. Yeah, so... Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was like they needed an 85 then on Metacritic, and they missed it by like one point, and that cost them all a huge amount of money in, in bonus bonuses and things like that. Okay. Heads up displays. So, uh, if you uh, go into the first person blueprints folder, in the blueprints folder, you'll see there is a HUD already set. It's called first person HUD. And uh, where does that get set? Where does that get attached to the world, you ask? Well... The game mode is something I've been meaning to talk to you guys about um, for a while. This is the starting point for your game. This is the, or this is like the entry point. If you've done C++ coding before, this is main. Okay, this is where it kind of starts. Okay, so the first person game mode. If you double click on that, you'll see it's just um, you can open the full blueprint editor if you want. There's nothing in here, so you don't need to. Um, the uh, the first person game mode, uh, shoot. Okay, there it is, right hand side there. Uh, it just sets these these few variables right here. You can also create global variables like for the whole level, like scores and things like that. Um, but it basically sets the options for the game. Okay, is your game possible, right? Um, 
what is the default HUD? When you start the game, what HUD appears on the screen? Uh, who, uh, what is the controller for player one? And the controller is what moves the player around. We do WASD, you know, what, uh, what is actually moving the, uh, the player when you do these different commands, like walk forward and backwards. Um, what is the default pawn? That's your floating arms of the camera, right? And that's where your blueprint is that we did last time with the E, the e and the, the use key, you know, and we just did a right click on it. This is where all that stuff gets set. And that's one of the nice things about having a template is the template sets all that stuff up for you. So you don't need to like go through like it, like especially when you don't know what you're doing, like, okay, where do I set a HUD? And where do I set the default pawn class? And where do I, where do I do all that? <clears throat> don't need to worry about it. It's done for you. So, but this is, if you're wondering why the first person HUD is attached to the screen <coughs> by default, it's because the game mode says that that's your default HUD. And the, the weird headless <coughs> thing there, that's the default person. Yeah. So, um, now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about first person HUD. And uh, ooh, that's really bright. I don't know if you guys can see the difference here. If I change the um, HDR mode on my new monitor that I'm going to return, uh, that's bright. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, but it's flickering. Like the thing's flickering bright and dark, bright and dark. It's kind of bugging me. I think it's trying to do like auto dim auto dimming or something like that. I don't know. Okay. So, uh, here we have the first person HUD. So what I want you guys to do is let me close back out, go into the first person blueprints folder, go to blueprints, go into first person HUD, and we are going to make a HUD. Okay. And what we want to do is have like a health bar for the person. So rather than, um, rather than like printing to the screen, your health, it'd be really nice to have a health bar, right? And if you want to be fancy, you could do like Zelda style hearts or something like that. Um, could probably figure out how to do that uh, using this. I'd probably recommend using UMG instead. UMG is the better version of what I'm about to show you here. So how does a HUD work? Let's take a look at this. This is the starting point for HUD. So every time the frame updates, it calls this function. So this is kind of like event tick. So every time the frame updates, it draws the HUD on top of the world. So you can have um, all sorts of decorations and things like that. And they're all 2D and they're all just like layered on top of the 3D world. So if you look at like Diablo 2, Resurrected, Screenshots, I don't know if I can support Blizzard anymore. Yay. Um, if you look at this screenshot here, you'll see that there's stuff going on on the screen. And then you've got these 2D elements on top of it here, right? So you've got a little portrait of Fishy Mancer and they've got a health bar, right? And Hammer Time's got a health bar and Ice Queen's got a health bar. And then down here, you've got some decorative elements with like an angel and a demon. Uh, some glass uh, balls holding your life and your mana. Uh, it's got some icons down here that are clickable. It's got some potions that are clickable, or you can use the number keys. And this is your left click, and this is your right click. So um, all of these things would be drawn in the HUD. Okay? All these are drawn in the HUD. So how do you do it? Um, there's only a couple of really basic tools for this kind of stuff. Um there is drawing text, like the name. There is drawing a picture, like the portrait. And there's drawing a rectangle or other shapes, like the health bar. So let's do that. If, if uh, uh, it's really frustrating, it's saying, hey, stone doesn't exist. You can use stone as an available option instead. The bug reports for your mods and white crash is really good. Expect this error. Uh, what, what are you talking about, Avina? So let's let's do this. Let's do the let's do a health bar. Okay, even a portrait. Maybe we can steal this. Do you think do you think we get sued by Blizzard if we uh, stole the assets for uh, the necromancer portrait? <laughs> uh, 
I'm not going to risk it. Their their lawyers are <laughs> probably uh, pretty active right now. Okay. So there's three tools. There's three nodes. Uh, one of them is called Draw Texture. Draw Texture draws a picture on the screen. There's one called Draw Text. Draw Text puts text on the screen, like the fishy mancer. And the third option is something called Draw. Well, there's different shapes and things like that, but um, you do lines, but Draw Rectangle is the is the third option. So these are these are the three basic tools for doing a HUD. Can you guys see all this stuff? Draw texture, draws a picture on the screen, draw a rectangle, draws a rectangle on the screen. And you can choose the color and you can choose the screen coordinates, uh, the top left and bottom right corners essentially of it. Um, and then you can draw a text. So. Let's let's do let's do let's do yeah like what we just saw there in Diablo. Does that does that sound good to you guys or is there is there like um, another HUD that you'd you'd like to see? Any any preferences is the Diablo two style HUD? I'm actually going to use not their art assets because uh, I got I actually purchased some assets the other day. Hmm. Where you go? Hmm. All these things vanish. Interesting. Let's be saved there. Date modified, maybe. No. Okay. Well, um, to the humble bundle website, and maybe I can figure out where the stuff all downloaded. And I'll show you guys uh, some tricks, I guess, as well. Which is, if you keep an eye on your, um, if you keep an eye on things like humble bundle or the asset store and things like that. There it is. I purchased on July seventeenth. Why is it not? Why is it not? Downloading. So here's all the stuff. Okay. So let's try and find a portrait or something that we can we can use. Fantasy icons mega pack. This is actually better than browsing your computer anyway because you can actually look at the different look at the different things. Eh. Black Crusader UI. So uh, there's also different um, screen elements and all these things you can render to the screen using draw texture. So you just provided an X and a Y location on the screen, you call draw texture and it draws it on the screen. And so these these uh, asset packs are really nice because I'm not an artist, I've, I've said that before. And so you can draw like uh, this on the screen and then you can draw the different icons from the different packs on the screen on top of it and then you've got inventory or, or something like that. So let's see. We want just like a portrait. We want like a person's portrait. Uh, character avatar icons. That sounds fascinating. All right. So yeah. Okay. Perfect. Nice. All right. Uh, so I'm gonna download this and f oh, I put into Unreal projects. Okay, that's where you are. Okay. All right. So it's under Unreal projects. All right. Um, this one I'm just gonna save up on the desktop. So I don't have to browse around anymore. And let me show you guys how this process works. So desktop, character avatar icons, extract. Mm. Trying to do like some sort of necromancer. What do you guys think? Uh, anyone jump out at you as being like a, a necromancer? You guys think? That kind of looks like a young Emperor Palpatine or something. The assassin or the warrior helmet? Uh, the assassin. Where's the assassin? Uh, 
A cultist five. Oh yeah, yeah, I can see that. Cultist, yeah, yeah, okay. Cultist five, M thirty six or M thirty two. That guy, a necromancer. Oh, and maybe that guy. That guy looks like. That's kind of like the Lich King, huh? Like, like that's like uh, like Arthas and is uh, having a bad day. Um, yeah, okay. Let's go with let's go with cultist five. All right, I can I can work with that. All right. So, uh, okay. So I'm gonna pop back into Unreal Engine, and I'll just move this out of the way real fast. Go into the Bill folder, <clears throat> and I will compile the shaders. Where you compile the shaders? Don't touch anything. All right. Uh, I'm gonna import uh, to game Bill. I'm gonna go up to the desky top, and I'm gonna bring in character avatar windows and uh, cultist five. Okay. There we go. So we got a texture. A texture is just a 2D picture. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, this thing here, don't draw off using a VR headset. Uh, I'm going to delete this because I don't like having clutter in there for VR when I'm not using it. Okay. So let's look at what is happening right now before we, before we add our portrait. So this runs every tick, right? So every time the frame updates, it draws the HUD on top of it. So we've got our 3D world rendered with like barbarians cycloning around and whatnot. Then on top of that, we're gonna draw a 2D interface on top of it. So what's happening here is that it, it passes in the size of the screen. This is the resolution. This is how many pixels uh, wide the screen is. And this is how many picture, pictures, pixels tall the screen is. And so if we wanna draw something in the middle of the screen, we divide it by two, right? So halfway across, halfway down, there we go. And it's actually adding 20 to Y because I think the I think that the way the picture draws, I think it comes off the uh, the point or something like that. So they're, they're kind of dropping it down so that when it draws up, it, it'll be centered still. Okay, so um, we've got uh, yeah, there it is. Offset size wide align cross earth projectile. Yeah, okay. So like when the ball comes out, it'll be it'll be lined up with it. And so then we've got a call to draw texture. Uh, draw texture draws a texture. It draws a picture on the screen. Nope, 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 nope. Trying to move you. It draws a picture on the screen. And what does it take? It takes itself. Itself is the HUD. Uh, the texture it's going to draw is first person crosshair, which if we look at it is that little cross thing that we see on the screen. It's itty bitty and tiny on my uh, on my screen because I have a 4K monitor and we are not doing any UE scaling. Uh, UE scaling would be definitely something to, to bake into the into your HUD. You, you really want it to look the same on all resolutions. And so um, uh, there's a couple different ways of doing that. Maybe the simplest is you just look at the current resolution and double the size of the crosshair or something. If you have a higher resolution screen, you double the size of the crosshair so that it looks the same on all, all these things. So the two parameters here, X, Y, and uh, uh, screen X, screen Y, these are the pixels on the screen that it's gonna draw to. And one thing, uh, can I send you the photo? Um, it's copyrighted, man. You can't ask me to pirate. That would be, that would be completely immoral and unethical. Ignore me dragging that over onto Discord, please. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, here. So, uh, one note. Um, so, how do screen coordinates work? Um, if you've never worked with image processing before, this might be a little surprising to you. Um, zero, zero is actually the top left part of the screen. So, if you have a big computer monitor like this, uh, zero, zero is the top left of the screen. And then X goes this way and Y goes this way. So if you're at screen location 100, 100, it's gonna be here. And if you go down to 100, 200, you're actually going downwards. So the Y axis actually goes down. And this is something that gets a lot of people. In algebra, you know, it goes like this, right? You know, X is to the right and Y is up. Not in screen coordinates. In screen coordinates, the top left is zero, zero, and as Y increases, it goes downwards. So that's that's the one gotcha you need to pay attention to. 
<coughs> row and column. Uh, other way around. X is the column. Right? Yeah, these are columns. And then Y is the row. And so uh, we actually write the coordinates yeah, backwards from the way that you might you might think, right? Column then row rather than row then column. Okay. Um, yeah. So the, the only tricky part is th this is this is zero zero. Okay. So if I were to modify my HUD <clears throat> and just have it draw at zero zero instead, let me just hook this up to uh, nothing. Just to, I'll just disconnect this. <clears throat> if they're going to draw at zero, 0, save, compile. I like to click those always in the opposite order. I draw it. Uh, you, you can see in the very top left corner of the screen there, um, there is, the crosshair is being drawn uh, at zero, 0, Okay, And you can see that the uh, texture is being drawn down into the right. So zero, 0 is the top left corner that it's drawing, and then it draws 16 pixels right, 16, 16 pixels down. If I modify this <clears throat> so that it's at uh, 100 by 500, then um, that's going to be 100 pixels right and 500 pixels down. So you can see over here, it's 100 pixels to the right, 500 pixels down. That's where the crosshair is now. It's still really small, so let's make it bigger. So rather than being uh, rather than being 16 pixels wide, the W stands for width. I will make it um, 64 pixels wide, 64 pixels tall. So compile and save again. And you can see now it's bigger, right? And uh, again, you usually want to scale these things based on screen resolution. Uh, a lot of games assume you're gaming at 1080p resolution. And that's super annoying to me because I am a 4K game for life, or at least until 8K comes out. <clears throat> and um, I did say IPS gang, but uh, to be fair, I, I came I came like this close to buying an OLED for my monitor last night. The only the only thing stopping me was the fact that it's five inches bigger than this thing that is already uh, uh, challenging my generous dust space. So. so please, when you guys make games for reels, uh, please allow 4K people to have a usable uh, user interface. Okay, so. Let's put this back in the center. And uh, when we do it now, you'll see that, hey, the crosshair is actually visible and stuff. Yep. Stab, stab, stab. There we go. Okay. So the, uh, the things you pass to draw texture are um, the texture, the picture you want to draw. Uh, the location on the screen where you want to draw it, the width and height of the picture, and that doesn't have to match the original. It'll scale up or it'll scale down. The UV coordinates, remember U and V refer to uh, the location within the texture. Uh, let me uh, change that and you can see what happens here. Um, <laughs> well, actually, let me make it random. This will be funny. I'll make it from, I don't know, negative 10 to positive 10. And I'll do that for both directions. So I'm, I'm going to be randomly adding to the UV coordinate. <laughs> and so what's happening is that it's, it's sliding the picture in. So when you change the UV coordinates, you can actually slide where the, tic where the texture appears. And right now I'm just randomly picking a, a number from negative 10 to positive 10. So it's just sort of randomly, and, and it's doing it in both directions. So it only slides along a diagonal. If I do separate, uh, if I do separate numbers for both, uh, Control W, then you'll see it becomes even more random than that. And so now it's it's uh, some cool like cyberpunk thing. I don't know. Your uh, your bio, your uh, your chip is crashing or something. I don't know. And so it, it's still the same. It's still the same crosshair. It's just sliding the thing around randomly every frame. 
Uh, in general, we don't need to mess with that though. And you can scale those as well. Okay. Uh, then finally, it takes a color. And so um, we're, it, it's taking white. You're like, wait, I thought it was red. Yeah, well, the, the, the picture itself is red. And so one times anything is the, the thing. So it's, yeah. it's that. Uh, and then you can scale it up and rotate it and stuff like that, which we don't really care about. Okay. So uh, now that we've done that, the next thing we're going to need to do is put our Necromancer into the game. So we are going to uh, control W, the draw texture node. And we are just going to hook it up like this. You can draw as many things you like on the HUD. Yeah, okay. And the texture here is going to be called uh, ass. Uh, what, what was it? Cultist? Be a dope effect if you got EMP'd. Yeah, it would be. Like, um, you get EMP'd and then all of your uh, HUD elements just start randomly shifting around on the screen. You can probably do a better version of it than that where it would jitter, you know, rather than just randomly jumping around. You would jitter it one to the right or one to the left randomly and then the things would kind of kind of go like this on the screen. That would be kind of cool. All right, so there we go. Cultist 05. We're drawing it screen location 00. It's 6464. Just too small. Um, let's make it 256 by 256. And just give that a shot. So it's going to be in the very top right corner of the screen. Yeah, what do you guys think? Is that is that a pretty good uh, size for it? Or bigger, smaller? What do you guys think? One thing you use HUDs for, by the way, is to do dialogue, right? So you walk up to the uh, you walk up to the uh, security guard here, and it puts a picture on the screen. Hello, how are you doing today? You know, or halt, you know. So if you want to do like a two D visual novel kind of thing, um, you can do that entirely in the HUD if you'd like. Uh, what do you guys think? Is that too big, too small? Um, I definitely want to move it down a little bit, like. Um, uh, maybe I'll move it like to 200, 200, like that. Perfect size. Okay. Now that's a little bit too far in. Maybe 100, 100, like that. Yeah, looks, looks about right. Okay. 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 So now let's draw our name below it. Okay. So um, all of these things probably should be parameters like that you could tweak, you know, so that you don't have to really do this, but whatever. We're just going to hard code it for now. Uh, so the text, what was it called? Fishy cultist or something like that? Fishy cultist from that previous thing. We're just kind of recreating the Diablo HUD a little bit. So black text, what color text? Like white text, maybe. White text. And then the location. Um, in, in the Diablo thing, I think they put the health bar above and the name below, right? So, uh, so if this thing starts at 100 and is 256 high, then this is going to start at 356, uh, sorry. Now for the X, X coordinate, uh, it's just gonna be 100. And then for the Y coordinate, uh, it's gonna be two, 356, and then let's move it down a little bit more. Let's make it like, let's give it like 20 pixels of space between it, so 376, something like that. Font, doesn't have a font, fantastic. That's exactly what I wanna see, all right. Play, and there you go. So you can see Fishy Cultist is barely visible um, below the, uh, the picture of Fishy Cultist. Uh, let's scale this up three times. Yeah, there we go. All right, so we got that. Now the only thing left we need to do is the health bar, right? Uh, do you guys have any questions about this? Um, why did I pick 100? Because I want it to be left lined up with a box above it. And then why 376 down? Because this guy starts at 100, goes down 256 from there, so it's at 356. And so I moved it like another 20 pixels below it. I'm just eyeballing these things. Like I said, these things should all be promoted to parameters and controllable and yeah, whatever. I just, you guys with me for now? 
Does this make sense? Every frame, the HUD ticks. It's going to draw the crosshair in the center of the screen. It's going to draw the cultist image in the top left. And then it's going to draw the name uh, below it. Okay. So the last thing we need to do is do the health. So I'm going to start off, as I always do, just with some, like, uh, debuggy, you know, like a little, a little, you know, fake health bar. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I am going to draw a green health bar, right? Because at 100% it's green, I think, right? Make it, make it like health bar green, maybe like that. Okay. It's a health bar green and it's going to be 100 from the left. That's screen access 100. And then we want it to be big do we want it? It's width is going to be 256. It's height. I'm going to guess like 40 pixels high. And this is something that would all need to be scaled and stuff like that. And then it's Y location would be if it's 40 high and we want it to have 20 pixels of space above the texture, then um, it started at 40. If we start at 40, it goes down 40, then there'd be 20 units of space before 100. And I'm just trying to visualize this in my head. Um, oh, it's covered up by the shift mouse one. Okay, no, there we go. All right, cool. Right, all right, so there we go. So we've got our portrait, we've got our health bar. Uh, the health bar actually looks like it's sticking out a little bit too far, which is funny, but it's actually because the portrait itself uh, it has transparency in it, so the the, the right half of it is uh, um, like we don't see the right edge of the the portrait. That's actually good. Okay, um, what do you guys think? Make it a little more narrow, like a little. Is it a little like too thick right now? What do you What do you guys think? Or I could pull it in a little bit because the portrait is the portrait kind of stops at about. 80 or 90% of the way, I guess. Uh, it does take a lot of space. Uh, could add a border. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, all right, so let's, sure, let's do that. Okay, so let's uh, turn this into a, uh, I don't know, uh, we'll do a white border, I guess. And then we'll draw the health bar inside of it. All right, so. Color, uh, I wish I got rid of that health bar color, it's kind of nice. Uh, we'll do, yeah, it looks like health to me. And so I'm gonna move it in a couple pixels, like five pixels to the right of the border. Starting 45, width is 246, height of 30. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a five pixel border um, on each side of this thing. What do you guys think? Border too thick? What do you think? Health bar too thick? Do you like the colors? The colors are a little weird to me. I think. You like it better? Eh. Black? Would a black border look better? How did Diablo 2 do it? I close that? I did, didn't I? Hmm. Okay, here it is. Sir, guide to things. Really, it's not letting me zoom in. Okay. Um, super low resolution. Uh, it doesn't have a border on it, does it? It's just a flat bar. Oh, but they put a border on the portrait. Okay. It's like a gold color. It's actually another picture, I think, actually. I think it's actually a picture frame. And so in order to do that, uh, let me just leave this open in the background. If I want to do a picture frame on that guy, uh, I just draw a texture, kind of like what I did here. I draw a texture and then I draw the portrait on top of it. 
Um, and I think in my art assets, I've got a picture frame or a set of picture frames, but um, do you guys understand how that works? Like you just draw one thing and then you draw another thing on top of it. Good to go. Um, maybe I'll just make this. Really? Reading C++ symbols? I'm adjusting the color, dude. Come on. Uh, is it playing? Oh, that's why. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, I'll just make this gold colored. Uh, save, compile, run. Hmm. Eh. Eh. I don't really like the color scheme. Black it is. All right, let's try that. So we've tried white, we've tried gold. Let's try black now and just see. I really wish the uh, Shift F1 for mouse, click for mouse control. It's just, it just starts off right on top. Oh, uh, that doesn't look bad. What do you guys think? It's not bad. It stands out against the sky. It stands out against the grass. Looks nice. There's a border on the picture. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, well... Okay, so we've got that, we got the name, we got the health bar. Okay, now that we got that, now we need to uh, actually get the health of the player. So uh, we can do this in, right now we can't do it. <laughs> we need to go into the player. Um, so the player, remember uh, we talked about making it public. First person character, first person character health is set to private. If we set it to public, then we'd be able to read the health out of the player. Um, kind of feel like we should have like a max health maybe. Or we can have health be a function. We could have a get health function. We would return a number from zero to one. And then the HUD would only need to know what percentage of health you have to know whether it should be green or yellow. Or, yeah, let's do that. Okay. There's there's always lots of different ways. You could, you could just make this public and then grab it out of the HUD, but I'm, I'm actually going to create a new function. I've got a function called take damage, so I'm going to add a new function, and this function will be called get health. Uh, maybe I shouldn't call it that because like if you... Do that. It's technically called get health. Also, okay. Anyway, so uh, we are going to we got get health here. So we're gonna have an output, and the output is gonna be uh, two. No, should we do health and max health, or should we do a percentage? What do you guys think? Do you want us to output both health and max max health? If we do that, then maybe our HUD could display like we're at one hundred out of two seventy eight health or something like that. Or do you want to just output a float that's like, um, do you need just like a float that's like a number from zero to one? Health percentage. So if our current health is 76, we divide it by 100, that'll give us 0.76, and that'll be returned. So that's one way we can do it. Um, another way we can do it is we could just return health and max health. This should probably be a variable. Yeah, let's promote this to a variable. Um, and so this will be called max health. Because who knows, maybe later on we'll... Ooh, 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 ooh. No. No. There, better. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll allow the player to gain more max health and say... Things like that. So, so this is just going to return a number from zero to one, and uh, maybe we can return these values some other time. It's fine. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to get the health of the player. So uh, get player character. All right. Player character, and this returns. We're going to have to cast this to first person character that's that will give us the thing uh, insert that. Okay. so uh, we're gonna get we're gonna get the 
we're going to get the main character. It's a single player game. And we're going to get that and then we're going to call the get get health function on it, not get health. That's why that's why I didn't want to call it that. Um I don't know. Names are hard. So I'm going to get the health of the um of the player. And then the health percentage will be, let's see, the width, I'm going to promote that to a variable, just to, to variable, and you'll be called the health bar width. Like I said, all of these things probably should be variables, but uh, okay, so that uh, that is going to be multiplied by the health percentage. So if our health or if our health percentage is 0.8, then 0.8 is going to be multiplied by however many pixels this is, uh, which is 246 by default. Um, and so as we as our health decreases to zero, the health bar will shrink. From 246 pixels down to zero smoothly. Um, we need to hook it up, and the other th oh the other thing we need to do is is pick the color, right? Um, let's yeah, let's first test this and just make sure this works. I just want to make sure that this thing works first, then we can add different colors to it. All right, there we go. So as it's hitting us, our health bar is going down. See that? So we don't, you know, we kind of don't need the uh, the debug text prints anymore, right? Okay. So we're dead. Can't move. We're done. Okay. Right. Um, and if we wanted, we could put a health bar over the um, over the uh, the security guard too. If we wanted. Uh, that would be using what's called a project um, a project uh, node. Not project, that's di that's different. Uh, but there is a, a project node where you can pass in the location of the security guard, and then that will tell you um, what spot on the screen you need to draw the bar. And so you can have a floating um, health bar above the security guard, which is kind of cool. All right, so we need to do an if statement or something, right? So. Mm. Maybe you know. Maybe we'll just do this one. Uh, maybe we'll just have this return node here. Maybe we'll have it just return a color also. This might make life easier on us. So we're gonna return the color for the health bar. I'm not sure where this belongs exactly, but uh, this will be a vector maybe. Color. Uh, let's see. Is that what it takes? Linear color structure. Color structure. Linear color structure. There, really. Linear color. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Linear color structure. Okay. Making sure the type of this matches the input on here, the near color structure. Okay. Okay. So, um, so in here we can just do a couple branches. Branch. So if um, this is greater than or equal to, what do you guys think? When when should it be? Uh, when should it be green? Like how much health? How much health should green be? What do you guys think? Any uh, 70%, 60%, 80%? What do you guys think? It's a good number. 100% for green? Okay. Easy enough. Um, and I'll make it 0.99 just because it's a float. 
Cool. So if it's uh, if it is um, if it is that, then we will return green. Otherwise. I wonder if we can, can we duplicate this? Okay. Should probably set that as a variable. Oh. Uh, otherwise, if our health is greater than or equal to, what do you guys think is good for yellow? What's a good number for yellow? What percentage? Fifty percent or above is yellow. Okay. Thirty percent, sixty percent. Uh. Uh. Yeah, we'll get point four maybe. Average you guys out a little bit. Okay. So. And then uh, we actually don't need that. Then uh, we will do yellow. If they're health is above like four. And then finally, uh, if it is poor, if their health is four, then we are gonna return red. So now we're getting health bar color out, so we can just feed that in here. That way our head doesn't need to know that. Although maybe it should know it. I don't know. It's hard to say. It's hard to say who know, who should know things. Who should know how the health bar works? Maybe it should be the head. I don't know. Okay, so there we go. So we're, ooh. Oh, there we go. Okay. Taking damage. Taking damage. Taking damage. Taking damage. It's in red. And we are dead. Oh, it went negative. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> Do you see that? It drew it, it drew it backwards. And this is something you have to be uh, careful of, actually. Um, take damage. The take damage function. Uh, if we do set dead to be true, then we should also set our health to be zero. Um, set health to be zero. So that way, this is, this, is, this is something that actually crops up in a surprising number of games which is that um, you can die uh, more than being dead. <laughs> you can you can over over die. And it presents weird issues like um, healing. Like if somebody tries healing you and you're like at negative 1000 life, then you know, present issues. UE elements also draw weirdly. There you go. Okay. Maybe we can Maybe if we're dead, we'll draw a giant X over the person's face. What do you think? <laughs> so, branch. So, if health bar percentage is less than uh, 0 0.01, if they're dead, essentially. If they're dead, then I'm going to draw... Um, I'm going to draw a texture over their face. <laughs> Do you guys see what I'm doing here? It's so like, if if their health is... And I can make this even lower. Right? If their health is... Uh, eh. Yeah, whatever. If their health... If they're dead, then I'm going to draw the crosshair, but I'm going to draw it over their face. And I'm going to do that by rotating the crosshair so it turns into a x instead of a plus going like this 45 degrees and uh let's see here the screen coordinates should be 100 100 and 256 256 so that should drop the that should drop the crosshair over the player 
If they're dead. If they're not dead, it doesn't. Taking damage, taking random damage, taking random damage. Ah, didn't center it correctly. Uh, okay. Um, hmm. I don't know how much I want to mess with this. Actually, uh, I'll just move it a little bit right and a little bit up and just call it a day. It's not, it's not something I really care about too much. Alright, um, what do you guys think of the HUD? Do you guys see how easy it is? Can you see your get health function? Ah, too far to the right. Fine, fine, fine. I'll do it one more time. Uh, what do I have before 256? Um, Uh, get health function, yes. The get health function is this. I'll screenshot it for you. Um, and so you don't technically need to do the health colors in there. Maybe that would be better in the HUD because the HUD's kind of drawing the things. I don't know. There, there, there's always this debate over like who should know what the colors of the health bar will be. And maybe the HUD should know. I don't know probably a good argument to be made for that. Uh, but this is the main thing, right? So it's just returning a percentage health divided by max health. And that percentage is being multiplied by the default width of the health bar. And so as the health percentage goes down, then uh, the health bar shrinks. Okay, so let's say I did this. And do you guys think you can do this? There's just three main tools. There's also lines, I guess, if, if you're into that kind of stuff. Uh, drawing a rectangle, drawing a picture, drawing text. Come on. Uh, so close. Need, still needs to be a little bit further west. Okay. I'll put it back at two, three, six. You draw any picture you want. You can make it so that uh, when you walk up to an object in the world, you can have a trigger, and uh, and then it displays a picture of the person, and you can, I don't know. Yeah, good enough. All right. And you can, you know, have dialogue and things like that. Okay. So that's a HUD. Uh, we got six minutes left, so uh, if you want, we can try put a floating health bar on top of the uh, top of the security area. You guys want to see that? I'll kind of run through the process again of setting up a HUD. All right, um, I haven't used. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, eh, yeah, whatever. Good enough. I haven't used the project node in a while, so um, I'm just gonna start off by just doing a project. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know where the security guard is. So we're gonna have to get all objects by class, get all actors of class. So we're gonna get everybody that is a security guard. So we can do health bars over all of them, actually. And so this is going to return an array. This is going to return all security guards in the world. And we want to put floating health bars above all of them. And so the main thing that you do with an array like this is you do a loop. You do a for each loop. Uh, yep. And so this is going to say for every security guard in the world. Cool. Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, we are going to get their location. Uh, yeah, probably for their eyes. Um, that seems good because we want to put the health bar kind of above their eyes and so this is going to give us their their eyes location so what i want to do is do a project 
Not project, project. Uh, where did you go? Why aren't you not here? Uh, HUD. Okay. HUD, oh, because it's not a white thing. Okay, fine. So we're going to project HUD object. Oh, okay. Wait. Yeah, okay. Location. It's going to come in here. So for every security guard, we're going to get the location of their... Um, of their eyes and then we're going to do a project and that's going to tell us where what pixel right so like if we're looking at this guy what pixel is this spot right here it's it'll be like it's 2000 to the right and 1000 down okay really nice that's linear algebra guys so um you don't need to do it it's done for you all right cool so what we're going to do now is i am just going to draw a rectangle at that location i guess and um and just see if it is in any way accurate. Okay, so this is giving me an X and Y location. So let me just split this. Oops. Let me just split this open. And so I'm going to feed this into X. I'm going to feed this into Y. The screen width, I'm going to make it 140 pixels high. And I'm going to draw it in what color? I'm going to draw it in pink. Why not? So for every security guard in the screen, we're going to get where their eyeball is, and we're going to find out what X and Y location on the HUD it is, and we're going to draw a rectangle above it. Actually, not above it, on it, really. I just want to see if this works. Nope. It's drawing nothing. So, yay. Now we get to figure out why it's not doing anything. Uh, first of all, um, let's turn off the print things because we don't need those anymore. Um, first person character. Um, take damage. Take damage. We are going to disable you. Uh, break node links. Thank you. And we're just going to. So we're going to turn off that. And for the security guard, I'm going to turn off, well, I guess as long as I don't shoot, it's fine. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to print um, string. I'm going to print um, what number security guard it is. Just, it should be zero every time, but I just want to make sure. And if it doesn't print anything like it's doing, then it's not working right. So, yeah, you see how it's not printing anything to the screen? Okay, cool. So, we're getting all actors of class security guard and it's not returning anything? Hmm. Curious, curiouser, and curiouser. The ray index is not getting printed. Um, completed. Uh, just to make sure this is running. Um, print string. I'm going to print loop done. Compile, save, play. Ah, it's not even getting in there. Interesting. See that? So it's not uh, set a breakpoint on this. Run it. Yeah, it's never even getting there. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, draw texture connects to get all actors of the class. Set a breakpoint on that one. Play. Huh. Or if you cannot set breakpoints on HUD events or something like that. Weird. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's not printing anything to the screen. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, this only happens if you're dead. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, all right. I was, I was working my way there, Shami. I was breakpointing and, and printing and, like, I was working my way back. All right, yes, yes, you're absolutely right. This only happens if you are uh, dead. Okay, so let's branch this way. Yep. Uh, so let's take all this stuff over here. That makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. So you come down here. So if we're dead or not, it actually isn't going to matter because they're both going to oh, reroute you. Uh, so even if we're dead, should we draw the health bar? Why not? Okay, so if we are dead, if we're not dead, it doesn't matter. We're going to do this now. Hopefully it should work. Might be a little spammy. There we go. Loop done, loop done, zero. Cool. So it is, in fact, finding one security guard in the world. Um, all right. Don't need you anymore. Don't need you anymore. Don't need you anymore. Instead, we're just going to try drawing the rectangle over its location. Now I get to see if I remember how to do projection nodes right. Yes, good. Excellent. Okay, so you can see as I move around, it is projecting. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, because the, the health bar is not scaling based on how far away we are from them. So it actually looks like the health health bar gets bigger and smaller, but what's actually happening, it's just the same number of pixels in every location. So you can see there, oh, I'm dead, dang it. Um, you can see there that it is drawing a, a health bar exactly on the spot that it projected to. So as, the, um, as I move the camera around, you can see the health bar just sticks right on top of that security guard there. So what I need to do is basically, um, so that works. Okay, so I just need to add a little bit to the the up. Um, so let's subtract, because remember subtraction is up. Let's subtract 40 pixels maybe off of it. Again, this isn't doing UE scaling properly, but let's just get it off its face and probably off a little bit to the left as well. So let's Let's minus, uh, let's minus the X as well by 40. That should put it around the right place. And the health bar we're going to make green. This pink is a little obnoxious. Okay. And we need, to, we, we're going to need to scale it based on how far away we are from it. But that is still not good. Okay. Um, let's subtract. 200, 200, <laughs> yeah, we really need to account for the, uh, the distance on the thing. Um, okay. Uh, Um, let's just make this like negative 60 or something. Uh, not negative 60, 60. Yeah, eh, good enough. Like I said, we, we need to account for distance. So we're basically out of time. So. Uh, basically, what we do then is uh, the thing, the same thing that I talked about uh, before, which is you grab, you, you're going to make a get health function on the security guard. Um, you're going to call that. You're going to scale this based on the health um, under bill security guard new function called get health and it is going to return float it's going to range from zero to one and it's going to be called health and this is just going to be our health divided by our max health Again, we will promote to a variable. Uh, 
F2 is the shortcut, by the way, to rename things. Uh, max health. Compile save. Max health is 100. Okay, so there we go. I'm not going to change the colors on it because we're kind of out of time. But So the security guard now has a get health function on it. And so I'm just going to take the width. Oh, no, the width is 100 here. Okay, I'm going to... Uh, Um, I'm just going to call on the security guard. I'm going to call it get health on it. Like that. Back it up. And then the ooh, first person character. No, 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 not you. This should be on a security guard get health function. Security guard get health. Yeah, there we go. Like it doesn't have a color. I didn't set that up. Okay. So I'm just going to take U and multiply it. I'm just going to hard code it to 100, uh, 100 pixels. And that will be the width. And that should be good to go. The, the, main, the main thing that we need to do now is just have it scale properly based on how far away you are. So it doesn't do this weird floaty thing and shrinking thing. So as I shoot it, you can see the health bar goes down, stab, ah, and it's dead. Okay. And if I were to put multiple security guards in the world, alt drag, there's two of them now, it will do uh, two, which you can't really see until you get closer, two health bars, and they're both shooting me, so it's not good. Die! There. Okay. So that is that is that. That's that's HUDs, and that's the basic HUDs. It's not the good HUDs. The good HUDs um, use UMG, and there's a uh, there's a content learning examples thing on UMG. You can go through that. It's pretty cool. There's a lot of really neat stuff you can do with it. Uh, but yeah, you know, the tools that I gave you today is good enough for first semester game of development. Okay, uh, so any questions about about this kind of stuff? You can draw a rectangle, you can draw a picture, you can draw text, and then the project, uh, the project node will tell you where something in the world is on your screen. That's really useful. So you can do floating, you can do floating health bars, and uh, if you wanna do an aim assist thing, you can like draw an X over like the uh, dead eye in, um, the dead eye in uh, was it uh, Red Dead Redemption? Um, it'll yeah. you can like mark people. Um, yeah, it's not really showing it, but like you put on dead eye and you like kind of mouse over the different people and it puts a little X over them. That would be done using the project node because it's putting an X on the two D screen based on their location in the world. So project is a really, 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 really useful thing. Um, it's not showing the, the thing, whatever. Okay, so you can, you can implement all sorts of interesting things using that. All right, so your homework uh, is gonna be to do a, a proposal, um, and I'll probably have you rig up some sort of HUD as well, okay? So we will pick it up tomorrow, and we will start learning how to mod. Uh, maybe we'll do, what should we do? Either modding or animation will be tomorrow. Okay. So thanks, you guys, and I will see you tomorrow. If you have any questions, as always, message me on Discord, and you can always post your questions onto um, the help channel as well. Feel free, feel free to help each other out. Um, it's fairly unlikely I will accuse you of cheating unless you're just actually just copying things wholesale. Okay. All right. See you guys.